The invocation will be given by Dr. R. Sheldon Duker, pastor of Muncie's High Street United Methodist Church. Will the audience please rise? Let us pray. We thank you, God of all life, for the vision of those persons who perceived the need for this building we dedicate today and who conceived its shape and purpose. Creator God, we thank you for their imagination as they planned it, constructed it, and now present it for useful service. We give you thanks for the life and example of your servant, Robert P. Bell, whose name this building carries. May its service to this campus and community represent an extension of his lifelong commitment to the education of persons for personal enrichment and fruitful service to society. We pray that you would bless the use of this building as a resource to this entire region. May faculty use it to share the latest technology, to dream new dreams, to provide challenging opportunities for growth. May those who learn here find their world enlarged, their minds challenged, their skills sharpened, and their lives enriched. We lift this prayer to you, God of all creation, in trust and confidence that it will be fulfilled. Amen. Welcome to the dedication of the Robert P. Bell Building. We're happy that you can be with us. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce to you members of the platform party. Members of the Board of Trustees of Ball State University, and I will ask uh, each of these individuals to stand and would you please hold your applause until they're all uh, recognized. Frank Bracken, President. Jim Gerritsen, Vice President. Jack Peckinpah, Secretary. And members of the board, Tom Corson, Jim Parks, Raylene Peterson, Jim Smith. We have a number of special guests with us as well. Lieutenant Governor John Mutz. Is Lieutenant Governor Mutz here? Yes, Governor, nice to have you. I didn't see whether you were in that uh, procession when we came in. Yes, it's good to have you. Members of the Indiana General Assembly from the House. Representative J. Roberts Daly, Speaker of the House. Representative Hurley Goodall. Members of the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, Clyde Engel, Commissioner. Van P. Smith, Member of the Commission. We have a number of other special guests we'd like to recognize. Alice Fryman, Indiana Central University. Anthony Ralston, State University of New York at Buffalo. Robert Goleski of Walter Scholler Architects, the architects for the building. William Shuck of Towsley Bixler Construction Company, the builders for the building. Eric Ernstberger of Rundle Ernstberger and Associates, the landscape architects for the building. James Carey, mayor of the city of Muncie. Sheldon Duker, who you've just met. And university officers, Jack Byrell, vice president for student affairs. Thomas Kinghorn, vice president for business affairs. James Cook, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. Robert Linson, Vice President for University Relations. Richard McKee, Assistant to the President. Academic Deans, Robert Fisher, Dean of the College of Agriculture and Planning. Michael Gemanani, Dean of the College of Science and Humanities. Ted Kowalski, Dean of Teachers College. David Wheeler, Dean of the Graduate School. Lloyd Nelson, Dean of the College of Applied Science and Technology. Neil Palumba, Dean of the College of Business. Joe Rawlings, Dean of Continuing Education. John Urice, Dean of the College of Fine Arts. Michael Wood, Dean of University Libraries. And chairpersons of departments located in the Bell Building are on the platform with us today. Daryl Adrian, Chairman, Department of English. Clinton Fueling, Chairman, Computer Science. Dennis Kramer, Director, University Computing Services. Don Whitaker, Chairman, Mathematics Department. Chairperson of the University Senate and, Depar and Department of Women's Physical Education, Jay Arasmith. President of the Student Association, Steve Lowry. And finally, our distinguished honorees, Dr. and Mrs. Robert P. Bell.
Thank you. And will the platform party please be seated? With us today to help us dedicate this new building is Lieutenant Governor John M. Mutz. He is a native of Indianapolis and received both his baccalaureate and master's degrees from Northwestern University. He was and is a most successful businessman and has served as a member of both the State House of Representatives and the State Senate. A recognized expert in the area of state tax and budgeting matters, Lieutenant Governor Mutz is also widely known as an expert in the field of programs for the mentally handicapped. It's our pleasure to welcome you, Lieutenant Governor Mutz. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure today as an official representative of the five and a half million people who live in the state of Indiana to bring greetings from all of them to all of you who are part of the Ball State University community, faculty, students, members of the Muncie community, and all the great alumni who are part of the culture and, and heritage and history of this institution. Whenever we have a chance to celebrate here in Indiana, uh, it is uh, often the, an occasion in which public officials are asked to add their words. And I'm certainly pleased to do that today, I suppose, for really three basic reasons. The first of these, obviously, we're delighted to, when we see the culmination of a very important physical addition uh, to a college campus, an $11 million investment in brick and mortar a facility that uh, will have a useful life that will stretch well beyond the lives of any of us who are gathered here today. And I suppose more than anything else, we celebrate the fact that here is a fine structure, but also we celebrate the kinds of activities that will take place inside this structure over the years that uh, enrich minds of individuals. And, and I suppose the thing that I always uh, say when I have a chance to address an audience that's involved in uh, higher education in this state is that it's the one institution in our society that stretches the human mind, that broadens the perspective, uh, that gives young people a look at a big picture that many of them never knew existed before. And so we celebrate all those things when we celebrate the existence of a new physical structure on a college campus. Particularly today, however, I think we celebrate also the rather unique combination of the disciplines uh, that will be studied in this structure, disciplines that involve what we in education call the very basics, mathematics and English. And those two basics will be joined with what will someday probably become a third basic, and that is computer science. Computer science, of course, is one of those things that uh, has become a part of our society in a record-breaking period of time. Uh, the computer chip alone, I suppose, is an example of change, more dramatic change than any of us have experienced probably before in our lifetime. Yeah, I am told that if a jetliner, for example, progressed with the same rapidity that the computer chip has progressed in recent years, that today a jetliner would cost about $500, fly around the world in 20 minutes, on five dollars worth of gas. <laughs> uh, that truly is an amazing kind of change and I think recognizes the rather profound influence that the computer is having on our world and our life. It probably more than any other single invention in our society makes the knowledge explosion work for society. <clears throat> knowledge alone cannot have an impact but knowledge that is organized, manipulated, analyzed and reanalyzed can make a tremendous impact on our society. So what we're discussing here today, of course, is a new interdisciplinary kind of approach, an approach that says that at Ball State in the future, every single student will have access to computer literacy, computer experience, and we know if they don't, they will not likely be in a position to remain as a competitive and useful member of society. So this is an important event because it recognizes the combination of two of the, the basics that have been basic since the beginning of learning, uh, together with a new basic, uh, which obviously will have an enormous impact on our ability to function as individuals in society. 
So we celebrate all those things today, and I'm, I'm pleased to note that uh, this effort at computer li literacy in Indiana is taking place on the college campus at the same time that it's taking place in the other portions of our educational network in this state. That is, through kindergarten all the way to high school, this year alone, 18,500 Indiana school teachers will be trained in computer literacy programs in Indiana. Now, that's not all of them, but that is a substantial proportion. If we say in the public school system, there are roughly 50,000 plus. It won't be very long, about three years, until every single one of them will have added this kind of discipline to the tools that they work with. This is truly, I think, a commitment made by your General Assembly and by the state administration to computer literacy, uh, but it's also important to recognize that it's taking place on the college campus as well. So we've been celebrating two things. First of all, a new structure. Secondly, a new approach to the basics. And third, today, we express our profound appreciation here in Indiana for a lifetime of service from a dedicated human being who has served this great university for over 35 years and has served this great state during that same period of time. Bob Bell is an individual who I grew to know when I first came to the Indiana General Assembly back in 1967. Uh, there were many times in which uh, we conversed about budgets for this institution. Uh, there were many times that uh, uh, he played a leading role uh, in making sure that the adequate kind of description was made available so that good decisions could be made. There were many times uh, in which he became, a, became an advocate and spokesman for higher education in this state and did it in an eloquent manner. There were many times uh, when we depended upon his advice uh, as we made very difficult decisions here in Indiana, both in the administration and in the legislative branch. I can tell you there is no one, absolutely no one in this state who commands a greater degree of respect for his personal integrity and honesty in every step of that process and in his service to your great university. Today, in addition to celebrating with you the first two events that I noted, I join with all Hoosiers who care about the future of this state in a salute to Mr. and Mrs. Robert Bell. We're proud of them and delighted that they have been part of our lifetime during our existence here on Earth. It's been my pleasure to be with all of you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor Mutz, for taking time to be with us today and for your continued interest in higher education and Ball State University. One of the special features of our program today will be the reading of the poem, The Building, by its creator, Alice Fryman. The poem was commissioned especially for this program. The author, Alice Fryman, is Associate Professor of English at a sister institution Indiana Central University. More than 50 of her poems have been published in 25 individual journals, and her work appears in a number of anthologies of American poetry. She is widely known on Indiana College campuses for her readings of poetry. Her latest work, Reporting from Corinth, was published by the Barnwood Press of Muncie this year. Professor Alice Fryman and her poem, The Building. Distinguished guests and distinguished hosts. I must say all this talk about chips and computers makes me so pleased that there are other people who are going to carry dinosaurs like me into the 21st century. Um, when I was asked to write this. I came, this was in April. I came up here to the building. You can't write from air. You have to write from 
things. And I was allowed, I had permission from the police to wander around with the people who were pouring cement, laying cable, stringing wire, and I noticed that they're not here today. But they are in that building. And this poem is for them and what they left here for you. The poem is dedicated to one of the people who worked on the building. Her name was Lisa Job, journeyman electrician. The poem begins with an epigraph from the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette. Muncie, Indiana is the fifth fastest disappearing city in the country. The building. In Muncie, Indiana, the 914 crosses McGalliard Road, pulling the night run, Northwestern, Falcon, KMC Cleveland, Chesapeake in Ohio, Illinois Central. Nursed on the tune of a whistle, the cars disappear like Hamlin's children into the side of the night. Muncie blinks her neon. Taco Bell, McDonald's, Kmart, Red Lobster, Marathon, Shell, McGalliard Road holds them tight to her skirts. But the next day, under the stands of mourning, on the furry tongue of coffee and a first cigarette, you can still taste the whistle's pull, the rattle of last night's cars going, the bitter bite of Muncie's children leaving. This building, this 4,900 cubic yards of poured concrete clothed in a brick skin was built to hold them. Over 100 men and one woman pulled and pushed and coaxed it up. Behind its wallpaper, blackboard, paint, under its floor, above its ceiling, they've left their message. It hums through the miles of conduit, cable and wire, tubing and pipe. It swirls in the black adhesive beneath the tile. It was mixed with the cement, driven in with each screw that fastened the tread on the stairs. With each arm that raised a tool, a drill, a hammer, a paintbrush, a broom, the wrench, the pliers, the trowel, the plane. Dennis Spears digging 100 post holes for bicycle racks in the 90 degree day after day, pounded it down the shivering length of his back, thudding it in stroke by stroke like a railroad spike. Before Jay Constant laid the floor tile, on his knees with a notched trowel, he wove from the graceful wand of his spine, left to right, right to left, swirling the black adhesive in shining black arcs, each giving birth to the next, laying the patterns that dreams make, spinning one out of the other with no end before they are covered down by the white floor of day. Bright auguries sealed in a dark function, a magic spell whispering under the foot. In the dim underground tunnels where you must walk single file because the great pipes are laid down end to end like bodies in a catacomb, Steve Dahl crouched, then crawled, pulling ribbons of cable as if he were Theseus in the labyrinth, unrolling the gift of Daedalus the spool of mathematics that measures and maps, 
the numbered line that bends around the bright corner of imagination to string the shadows. And they put joy. I watched as Gino Passiano, Nick Peterson, and Charlie Watkins poured concrete, first waiting in a stag line until she appeared, then dancing attendance on her still changeable youth. They moved as one, stroking her, smoothing her, easing her into her steps. Around their necks, down their bare chests, the sweat gleamed like tuxedos, satin lapels. This was prom night, and they the fortunate ones, chosen to escort the queen in her naked pudding flesh. Down the steps and onto the patio, where she spread out for them her heavy, pliable abundance. Music in the air, flowers, the sun a mirrored ball revolving in the sky. They have all moved on now. Wherever they touched, they left a print of their sturdy pride. Their work was to make a place for yours. Your work is to continue. Push the button on the water fountain. 60 feet of copper tubing deliver a bright, clean blossom. You must do no less. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. One of Ball State's outstanding musical organizations is its chamber choir. It's now our pleasure to hear this group under the direction of Douglas D. Amon.
Thank you very much, Ball State Choir. Earlier, I uh, recognized some of uh, the members of the House of Representatives who were with us today, and I uh, uh, overlooked uh, one person. I'd like to recognize him now. Uh, Representative Patrick Kiley is uh, here with us. Glad to have you with us, Pat. Our dedication speaker today is Dr. Anthony Ralston, Professor, Department of Computer Science, State University of New York at Buffalo. Dr. Ralston has had a rich and varied career in the field of information processing, both in the corporate world and in higher education. He is a prodigious writer and lecturer, as well as one of the leading consultants in his field. He has served as president of both the Association for Computing Machinery and the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. It's one of, uh, he is one of the most respected and influential members of the computing community in the U.S. and indeed the world. We're honored to have him with us today for his address, The Impact of Computer Science on Academe. Dr. Tony Ralston. Lieutenant Governor Mutz, President Worthen, Dr. and Mrs. Bell, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be here to talk at the dedication of the Bell Building today. This morning before coming over here, I had my first look at it. Quite extensive tour, in fact. It's a lovely facility and one you should be proud of. It turns out by an interesting coincidence that my office in Buffalo was also in a Bell Building. Turns out the first names are different, but the names otherwise are the same. Uh, it's also a fairly new building, only a couple of years old. Uh, I have to say that you just do things better in Indiana than we do in New York. Uh, both as to the amenities and the aesthetics, the building here is a great improvement over the one in which I live. Uh, I might note in particular that one of the useful things you've done in this building is to ameliorate the modern architecture with some antiques. Uh, one of the things I found this morning in going through s some of the rooms were two old IBM key punches. <laughs> In a mathematician's terms, buildings such as the Bell Building are necessary for quality education, but they're not sufficient. Perhaps I may be forgiven, therefore, if most of my remarks today are focused not at what this building does do, but what it doesn't do because no building can. There have been a number of reports in recent years by prestigious committees and commissions, national ones, about the parlous state of American education. Many have called it a crisis. My theme today is going to be that indeed there is a crisis in American education, and that improvements in SAT scores notwithstanding, it is deeper and more serious than is generally realized. Before getting to that, however, I'd like to note how happy I am to share this podium today with a poet, and in particular to say how happy I am that the Bell Building houses not only the Departments of Mathematics and Computer Science, but also the Department of English. If you had some method of measuring the intellectual distance from one discipline to another, then undoubtedly most people would say that the distance of, en of English to mathematics or computer science, or perhaps particularly to the latter, is very great indeed. Well, if so, that would be too bad. Mathematics, computer science, and English need each other. That is, of course, nothing more than a standard statement about the two cultures, which has been a subject of discussion among ap academics since at least the publication of C.P. Snow's book, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution in 1959. But it does bear some repetition. Cornell University has, for many years, had a course called Programming for Poets, for, as the name suggests, arts and humanities students. No university that I know of has a course with a title like Poetry for Programmers. <laughs> but such courses are needed, because computer scientists, even when they are not illiterate, are, are more often than not very few poor users of language. I hasten to add, very poor users of natural language, not programming languages. <laughs> very few computer science professors tell their students, as I believe they should, that if you come to college and, and had a choice between learning English well or learning Pascal well, you should unhesitatingly choose the former. 
Well, perhaps that's at least partly because professors of computer science are themselves not quite as good users of language as they might be. As an example, I refer to a manuscript that I reviewed recently in which two computer science professors use phrases like, we transition from one state to another. <laughs> now, few of you here, particularly, I suppose, the professors of English among you, are aware that transition is a verb. But that is only because you are not aware of the computer scientist dictum that every noun may be verbed. <laughs> More seriously, we need to do something to address the dreadful state of the writing skills of our science students. But alas, not just our science students. Suggestions have been made that word processing will be the vehicle with which to do this. Evidence for this, however, is lacking thus far, and I am not too hopeful. True, word processing does enhance such aspects of writing as spelling, through use of automatic spelling checkers, and the formatting of the text itself. But these things are not only not the essence of good writing, they are not really all that important to good writing. Still, on the positive side, it does appear to be the case. I know it's true for myself that writing has made a much more enjoyable occupation by a word processor than it ever was or could have been using a typewriter or a pencil and paper. Indeed, I used to spend large amounts of time myself writing longhand on paper. In those years since I've had a word processor in my office and at home also, I almost never do. Those of you who have not tried it really should. You'll like it. Anyhow, it's at least plausible that students who like writing more, or at least hate it less, will learn to do it better. Let me turn now to the current crisis in mathematics and science education. This crisis is deeper than is generally realized, in part because of the prevalent belief in the United States that the recognition of the problem is all that is needed to set the wheels in motion to find the solution. This might be called the man on the moon syndrome. Or in this case, it might better be called the quick fix syndrome. That is that an effective and not too painful solution is there to be seized. Thus, for example, one national columnist, Joseph Kraft, hails the intent of the administration to send a school teacher on an early flight of the space shuttle as evidence of an awakening to the importance of education in this country. And another national columnist, Carl Rowan, thinks that the educational picture is brightening because Congress is gearing up for that surefire American solution to all problems, namely, throw money at it. Well, to use the same terminology I used earlier, money, lots of it, is necessary if we are to do something about the ills of our educational system. But it is a long, long way from being su sufficient. Of all the proposed quick fixes for our educational problems, the one that I hear about most and the one that worries me most, is that computers in the classroom is the answer to our prayers. Thus, for example, we find respected computer scientists saying things like, and I quote, within 20 years, the computer will be the major delivery system for education at all levels, and in practically all areas, replacing books and lectures. Such a statement may be an effective means for prying research grants out of funding agencies. But frankly, taken literally, it is nonsense, dangerous nonsense. Not only is any revolution in education, such as is implied by that quotation, impossible in so short a time as 20 years, but more significantly, I see no signs whatever that computers are about to become our saviors in the classroom at any level. True, the computer is the most versatile and important piece of educational technology invented since the printing press. But educational technology is only that, technology. There is no evidence that the proper role of the computer in the classroom is more than as an assistant to a qualified teacher. Computer-assisted instruction has, in fact, fallen upon hard times. Ironically, it is in just those areas in which CAI has been most effective, for example, drill and practice and arithmetic, where there is considerable doubt about the desirability of developing such skills in children, by which I mean only that the development of technology like calculators 
and indeed development of other technology, so-called symbolic mathematical systems, mean that many of the skills which we have traditionally spent large amount of times trying to impart not just to primary school children, but also to high school children and to college children, college children if that's what they still are, uh, are no longer so valuable. They're not totally without value. Uh, as an example of that, I recall a story told to me by a professor of mathematics in a small college in the neighboring state of Ohio. Not too long ago, he went into a gasoline station, buy some gas, went to pay his bill behind someone else who'd bought both gasoline and some oil. The attendant made out the bill with the two items on it, got out his hand calculator to add the two items up. It was dead. The battery was dead. Well, paralysis occurred. <laughs> the, the, the attendant looked at those two numbers without the slightest idea what to do with them. Well, my friend, my friend who told me this story, because mathematicians are smart, got them out of this bind. He said, why not make out two bills? And so they did. <laughs> Anyhow, replacing teachers in classrooms by computers was never more than a utopian idea. Someday, maybe this millennium will be achieved, but not in any foreseeable future, and certainly not in time to help with our current problems. What to do then? First, recognize what the problem really is. Americans on the whole pay lip service to the importance of education, but don't really believe in it strongly. Certainly not as strongly as our main allies and competitors in the world. It's not just that school budgets are voted down. Americans don't really believe that teachers are very important people. Whatever the societal status of college professors, pre-college teachers have a status approximately equal to that of used car salespeople and real estate agents. We have today a desperate shortage of qualified mathematics and science teachers in our high schools. A statistic of note in that context is that Several years ago, and I don't think that things have changed very much since then, the entire output of colleges of education of mathematics teachers in the United States was about twice as much as required for replacement in the state of Indiana. Now that fact is not unrelated to the recent report on the second international mathematics study in which the performance of American students was uniformly average or below average compared to other countries. I guess, said Joe Crosswhite, who's the current president of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, that you'd have to say we are mediocre. What does it mean to be mediocre in mathematics, and I think also in science accomplishment? What would it mean even to be average? Well, it means that this country is in the process of dismantling its scientific and technological infrastructure, whose inevitable result will be the loss of the technical expertise and scientific genius that has made possible the 20th century American economic miracle. So forget about the current favorable economic statistics. The United States is on its way from educational mediocrity to scientific and technological mediocrity to economic mediocrity. And nothing can be done about this in a hurry. No amount of federal, state, or local funds will solve this problem quickly or by themselves at all. Teachers are not just poorly paid, their jobs have been rendered increasingly unpleasant by a society that doesn't really care about them and gives them a lower status than in any other industrial country. No wonder it is literally impossible to find a really bright, able youngster who wants to become a teacher. No wonder the head of the education department at Dartmouth reported recently that parents of those few Dartmouth students who might be considering becoming teachers, sometimes write to her, quote, begging for help in keeping their children from wasting their lives on teaching. How many of you feel differently about your children? We may perhaps solve this problem over a period of many years, but not, I think, in less than 20. Until we do solve it, the consequences are going to be much more painful than most Americans realize. To rejuvenate our educational system at all, however, will require leadership of a high order. And I suggest that leadership can come only from Washington, since it would be fantastical to expect state and local governments uniformly to do what is needed. 
And that leadership from Washington will have to involve more than persuading Congress to shift funds, massive funds, from other programs to education or to raise taxes to support education. Leadership of a still higher order will be required to create an upheaval in societal attitudes in this country, to convince the American public that support of education and teachers is in its own best interests, indeed is virtually a necessity. It will be a long, hard slog. <coughs> well, I come finally to the title of this talk. I have said that computers will not be the saviors of our educational system. But lest I be misunderstood, I want to emphasize that computers do have a most important role to play in education, particularly at the college level. They make possible presentations to students and allow exercises to be done by students that would have been impossible heretofore and which can add a new and sophisticated dimension to instructions in many disciplines. Of course, you all know this. What perhaps you have not yet realized, however, is that computer science as a discipline is going to have an even more profound impact on education than computers themselves. Computer science is a new discipline, less than a quarter of a century old. Yet it is already beginning to affect how other disciplines view their subject matter and how it should be taught. Mathematicians are beginning to see that the values and paradigms of computer science suggest new approaches to their teaching and research. Psychologists and philosophers are increasingly influenced by the actual and the potential in artificial intelligence. Various other examples are possible also. At the pre-college level, computer science is beginning to have important effects on how subjects, particularly mathematics and science, are or should be taught. It is only about 15 years since even some computer scientists wondered if their discipline was just a flash in the pan, and others wondered if it was a discipline at all. Such thoughts today would be ludicrous. It would not be unfair to say that computer science is becoming one of the centers of intellectual ferment in academe. Your new building, the Bell Building, provides a wonderful setting in which that ferment may develop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Austin. The Ball State Trombone Choir will now perform a special selection written for this occasion by Professor Wesley Hansen, the group's conductor.
Well done, trombone choir, and thank you very much, Wes, for that new composition entitled A Structure for Learning. We have now arrived at that part of the program when we focus upon the person who we honor today. We're here to confer one of Ball State University's highest possible honors, the naming of a building for an individual. Let me share with you some of the highlights of Bob Bell's impressive career. He is the first alumnus of Ball State ever to serve as its president. He has had a 48-year association with this university as student, alumnus, faculty member, and administrator. He had a 37-year career at Ball State, starting as assistant professor, serving as faculty member, department head, division dean, college dean, vice president for business affairs and treasurer, university distinguished professor, and is Ball State's 10th president. He is the scion of a proud Ball State family. Bob and Margaret Bell, their daughter Barbara and son Paul, are all Ball State graduates. Among them, they have a total of five Ball State degrees. Bob Bell is a higher education leader. He has served Ball State with dedication and distinction, and with vision and imagination. We take great pride in honoring him today by naming the Robert P. Bell Building in his honor. Dr. Robert Bell. President Worthen, Lieutenant Governor Mutz, members of the Board of Trustees, and distinguished guests, and that includes everyone. During my relatively long tenure at this institution, I frequently experienced reason for deep humility. And there have been those occasions that have provided reason for considerable feeling of pride. Today, I'm fraught with both. After having about three months to think about things, I'm beginning to realize just how fortunate and how honored I have been throughout all of that time. And when I hear this morning a trombone choir Doug Ammon's chorus. And I hear the messages that have been brought to you. What finer environment could one be a part of? It has been said that a house is a house until it becomes a home. It follows that a building is a building until it finds its use. It is the people who plan it, who use it, who live and learn in it, that give it meaning and give it value. And its value increases year after year as more and more people pass through its doors. This building in many ways was almost a miracle. And there are a few historical facts that perhaps we ought to establish. And relax, some of you, I'm not going to tell all. <laughs> it was during the second week of February, 1981, that the decision was made to press for the financing of the building we dedicate today. That was a little unusual. The legislature was in session. Now, I'd want you to know that considerable prior thinking had been given to the need for this building and what it should be and how it should be done. But it was at this time 
that this building became priority one. Well, history should record special gratitude to a few people here on the staff who were given the promotional responsibilities. And so often, they don't receive that uh, respect. And secondly, we owe a great deal to the Speaker of the House, to our local state representatives, and of course, ultimately, as our entire House and Senate join together to say yes, you need that building and Indiana needs that building and we will appropriate or we will provide the financing in order that you may go ahead and do it. Shortly thereafter, the architectural firm of Walter Scholler and Associates was selected. And they, along with faculty and staff members who had been designated to be a part of this building, diligently pursued the detailed planning thereof. Many of those faculty and staff will meet you in the building today. But I should like to recognize and congratulate now Mr. Robert Gloyeski, President of Walter Scholler and Associates, and Mr. Lee Cole, architect in charge of the project. Gentlemen, take a bow that we may salute you. Good fortune struck again when we found the lowest and best bid, and that's a part of our lives. The lowest and best bid for construction had been submitted by Towsley Bixler Construction Company, Incorporated of Indianapolis. Never have we experienced a smoother construction period, better cooperation, Fewer change orders, members of the board. <laughs> and on a time schedule that permitted us to move partially into the building three months early and with complete occupancy directly on time. If I could go back a few days, we'd have the field sports building built that way. With us today are Mr. William D. Shuck, President, and Daniel Kurtwright of Towsley Bixler. And gentlemen, I'd like you to stand in order that we may thank and salute you. <laughs> this has been a real pleasure, getting this mission accomplished. Now we are underway with the creation of what well may be termed a home of languages. The art of speaking, writing, reading, and understanding is certainly basic to all. We're glad the Department of English is in place and ready to produce the primary delivery to that objective. The language of number is also basic as we think. We speak, we measure, we interpret in number. And our Department of Mathematical Sciences is there. It is also here that we shall rush to meet the ultimatum for computer literacy. In the many languages of the computer the constantly unfolding uses being discovered, the specialties of high technology, and the innumerable opportunities for students of today and tomorrow serve to indicate just how important, timely, and proper this building and our new Department of Computer Science are to the future of the university and to the students who come to us. Finally, it is the computer services, which provides the language throughout the campus through the new fiber optic lines that connect all buildings.
now with the heart in this building. They will serve the administrative, management, and educational needs of the entire institution. To all of these groups, for all you have done to bring about this accomplishment, we thank you, we owe you much. Now, how do I express my appreciation to the Board of Trustees for the honor you accord me today? First, I should want to acknowledge the difficulty of your decision. For I realize there are many who have served this institution long and well and are well qualified for the honor. It has been my privilege and pleasure to serve Ball State University in a variety of capacities. And I'm proud to be numbered among its alumni. My parents were quite instrumental in my enrolling here in 1936. And while I sense they would approve your action, I can assure you there was no such anticipation in 1936. <laughs> As most of you know, our family is a Ball State family, even including our in-laws. But in addition to the degrees they hold from this institution, I would want to acknowledge the support they have provided for me throughout that time. When our children were small, I was attending many meetings at night on the campus and for quite some time, they thought my going to Pi Omega Pi meetings really were bake a pie meetings and would really lead to something good. <laughs> I didn't discover that for years after, but they never, they finally wanted to know, where's the pie? <laughs> but it has really been Margaret, who has been the judge, the conscience, the caretaker, the entertainer, the mother, well, really, everything except having a profession in her own right. Consequently, I am pleased to note that already the building is being called the Bell Building. For if the honor is proper, it is in that it is a shared honor rather than an individual one. I know of no greater honor you could, we could receive than that which you here confer. With all the humility I can muster, but admittedly, with much pride and tremendous appreciation, I and the Bell family thank you most sincerely, and it is only greater because it falls on my 66th birthday. Thank you very much. Will Frank Bracken, President of the Board of Trustees, please join me at the podium. <laughs> the building we are dedicating 
was planned, designed, and constructed to meet today's needs and those of tomorrow in the areas of science, technology, and the liberal arts. The building is completed, equipped, and is providing an atmosphere of, for learning for those students who are with us now and for those who join us in the future. Four and one half years elapsed in the development, planning, and construction of the Bell Building. It was erected at a cost of $11 million. It is the academic and administrative home for more than 175 members of the Ball State faculty and staff. The Bell Building has 118,400 square feet of space. It provides 293 rooms in which instruction and support activities occur, and it houses the academic departments of computer science, English, mathematical sciences, and the university computing services. I am pleased, Mr. Bracken, to certify the acceptability of the building and to present it to the Board of Trustees. This building will play an important role in the university's mission of teaching, research, and public service. We dedicate it to the education of future generations of students and to the state of Indiana. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I accept this fine new building. I also want to thank those who took a part in the conception and its progress through the channels of approval, especially the General Assembly of the State of Indiana. We appreciate the work of the architects, the contractors, and all of those who provided their skills and materials that brought the building to its being, and as you said, on time. The State of Indiana and Ball State University are grateful to all of you. And now will President Emeritus Bob Bell and his wife Margaret please join me to unveil the plaque which we'll hang in the building today. Why don't you? Yeah, why don't you go ahead? This, this concludes the formal part of our dedication program. As Bob indicated, it's a most special occasion, made even more so by the fact that this is his birthday. Happy birthday, Bob. We're not going to cut a cake, but we are going to move to the east entrance of the Bell Building, where we will cut a ribbon to simple, symbolize the opening of the building. We ask the audience to remain seated while the faculty recesses from the hall. Then we hope you will join us at the Bell Building for the ribbon cutting. Thank you for coming.